Coming up on First Updates Now Recap, four full weeks of the 2016 build season has been completed and we are winding down to stop build, but is it really stop build for many teams? Stephen McKinney from FRC 987, the High Rollers, joins us to talk about what's going on with last year's World Finalists. We also check in with a team from Down Under and a promising rookie from Florida. Now get ready for Fun Recap. This is First Updates Now Recap, episode 1602, recorded on February 9th, 2016. Recap is brought to you by Animark. Tuesday means it's deal day. Go to animark.com and click Tuesday Deals to pick up great products at amazing prices. And by audible.com. Get a free audiobook download and 30 day free trial at firstupdatesnow.com forward slash audible. Alright, cool. So just show off our cool robot. Do uh, go under the low bar. Oh, yeah. Do the, uh, can you do these? All right, you need to work on that one. Oh, oh, oh yeah, perfect. Now do the rock wall. All right, so we need to work on that one. All right, that's enough of that. Let's go, go, go. It's time for Recap, where we're here to discuss the latest on what's going on in First Robotics. I'm Tyler Olds. I'm Nick Olson. And Mike and Justin are our assignment tonight, but I'm very pleased to welcome Stephen McKinney from last year's World Finalist Captain, 987, the High Rollers. He's been on first since 2003 as a student on 987. Now he's a teacher and mentor at 987. Welcome to the show, Stephen. Oh, thanks for having me. I'm happy to be here. Yeah, man, and uh, I have to say uh, that I had the privilege of uh, visiting 987's build space this summer uh, when I was on vacation, and I really got to compliment you guys. You have a really cool work environment and have worked really hard to uh, mold that space in that you got a full field, uh, professional CAD space, along with some heavy machinery in a CAD lab. Uh, would you mind talking about uh, what how 987 has secured the space and resources? Sure, yeah, the kids these days, they've got it real good compared to what back when I was on the team we were uh, you know shoved off into the corner of a classroom um, but uh, you know we the woodshop program dissolved at our school and so uh, a lot of people were interested in the room but nobody wanted to clean out the sawdust and the old extractors and old machinery that's not too good for building robots it's pretty good for woodshop we managed to salvage a bandsaw you know what I mean but uh, we cleaned it up but it still wasn't an awesome space. We reached out to Lowe's and we were able to get several thousand dollars in grant money to remodel the shop. And it's, uh, yeah, we're proud of it. It's a great space to work and we've opened it up to the community. It's a really cool environment on weekends. There's like four or five teams in there building robots and yeah, it's a great time. We enjoy it. And that's really cool that you guys have opened up your space to other teams as well. Uh, hopefully they've been able to take full advantage of that and appreciate that too. Yeah, they have. Like I said, uh, we got four or five new, not new teams, but newish teams definitely in the last couple of years, you know, have sprouted up and uh, are taking advantage of it. We're trying to raise the level of competition in the area and hope that it pays off. Yeah. So you guys are actually the uh, third team that we've had on our shows uh, that have actually gone to the event in China. Uh, you guys went through this year, right? Yeah, we actually went in August, right before school started. It kind yes. of ran into the very beginning of school, but. Yeah, we missed you guys at IRI because of that. Yeah, it's two years in a row we haven't been able to go to IRI because of the conflict with it and everything. But uh, it's definitely cool to go into China. Wish we could do both, but you know you gotta pick one or the other. Yeah. What was that experience? Uh, you guys said you mentioned gone gone for a couple of years. What's that experience been like uh, for 987? How have you uh, benefited from it? Oh, it's phenomenal. I mean, uh, it's super cross cultural. I guess you could say. Like you go over there and you expect everything to be different, and I mean it is. There's the culture shock at first when you, you know, are riding the subway or eating the food over there. It's a little <laughs> questionable at times. But once you get to the arena and you set the field up and, you know, the teams are there and you're running matches and stuff like that, it feels you, you know, I mean, you feel right at home. It could be any regional or district event in the United States. So it's awesome. I don't know. Yeah. Well, we got a lot to talk about tonight, including a uh, deeper look into how 97 is going to be tackling Stronghold. But let's start off with our headlines in the FRC community. So there's been an interesting uh, topic of discussion. This kind of happens every year uh, to circulate around uh, 
what the role of a mentor should be in regards to building a robot. And specifically, there's been a uh, Chief Delphi thread uh, asking uh, what the role of a mentor should be in steering a team that's been getting too far off track. Uh, now, Stephen, I think we should take a broader view of this and discuss the roles of mentors on a program in general. We know every team is different, and not every team will find success in a particular method. But how does 987 the High Rollers approach the uh, involvement of mentors, specifically when it comes to the robot? Uh, I would say probably like a lot of teams, we're kind of the students are on the center of the design team. You know what I mean? We're kind of just there to make sure we're not designing something that's outside of our means or outside of theoretical limits or anything like that. But uh, it's student driven. We definitely help them out. Um, but we do steer the team, I would say, when we think that they're going the wrong direction. Sure. But I mean, uh, I don't know. We don't steer too hard, though, you know. We've had it where, against our advice, the students want to fight for a certain design, and it's wound up awesome. Like a like the turret in thirteen or 2013 robot, they wanted to put a turret on there against the advice of everybody. It turned out to be something, you know, that was really cool, that was unique, that uh, helped us a lot. And then we've had to go the other way, too, you know, where it kind of backfires. But you learn, you know, either way. And I don't know, it's cool when you're working with the students. They are... I don't want to say naive. They're just open-minded. They haven't <laughs> had a lot of experience with it. You know what I mean? So they've got yeah. these crazy off-the-wall ideas that, you know, you're kind of blinded by your experience, I guess, sometimes when you've been building robots for a while. You know, that's an interesting point because it's always good to have fresh young minds, even if, you know, you've been part of FIRST and you and I have been part of it for over, well over a decade now, uh, to be able to get those fresh young minds in, even if they don't know exactly what's going to work best in a robot, to get those ideas flowing is really important. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and, and the comment on you know on Wave, we we strive for a 50-50 partnership between students and mentors. We really like to have uh, mentors and students working side by side. Um, and you know, things things sometimes things go one way. We want them to go as a mentor. Sometimes they don't. And as you mentioned, right. it's just how you it's how you as mentors learn from the experience and how students learn from the experience. That's really important uh, moving on. And you, you really you know every team wants to generally have a successful season, right? And it, it's kind of how do you balance that act in between the two? So yeah, that's interesting. Um, so there's been some pretty cool prototypes and designs coming out of the uh, FRC community, and we want to highlight a few that we've seen over the past couple of weeks. Uh, maybe some teams that <laughs> so our first team we'd like to spotlight is uh, Team 4143 Mars Wars out of Illinois. Uh, I have to admit, I honestly didn't think we would see this, uh, Stephen. Uh, and if we, we can show it up on the screen, and if you're listening, uh, it's a swerve tread drive. Did you think we'd ever see this? Oh, I mean, I've never seen that. That's crazy. That's ambitious. I mean, we're afraid of swerves, so, you know, we've never yeah. even <laughs> attempted it, let alone this tank swerve thing. That is pretty awesome. That's ambitious. Yeah, and while the video itself, it doesn't actually show the holonomic motion uh, of the robot. You can clearly see there's dry pods on there uh, with the right. capability of swerve functionality. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it, kudos to them if they get it to go. I, I'd be worried about the uh, integrity of the drive with uh, having something snap off or something like that, but... Yeah, we haven't had a ton of experience on uh, wave robotics either with sword drives, and this team I know has had a lot of experience with it, so kudos to them if they can pull it off. Yeah, that's awesome. So, uh, Nick, what do you make of all this uh, with a treaded robot? Personally, I think it's, it's really cool, um, just from uh, the standpoint that it's never been done before from anyone. So looking at that, it's, it's pretty cool, and I'd love to take a look at it. Um, like you said, I do have some concerns on the the uh, the robustness of the design. It looks like I, I've gone through a lot of swerves, and it looks like they don't have a lot of module support when it comes to it. So that might be interesting to see with the uh, repeated hits on the rock wall and going over the moat multiple times and stuff like that. Yeah, and Mars Wars has a lot of experience with sword drive, so I'm I'm confident they'll get something going uh, that works out well for them. So here's another one. If you didn't see the Chief Delphi post, uh, we have uh, Team 6054 Dukes out of Ohio, a rookie team uh, showing off their autonomous mode. So let's take take a look at that. That's uh, pretty impressive if, if you're not watching it either. Let's see if we can get that up on the screen. So their video shows uh, the robot crossing the moat in auto and driving their robot uh, into scoring position into the low goal, and, which you'll see in a second here. Uh, if you're if you're listening to this uh, podcast, it's uh, really impressive to see a rookie team doing that. Uh, so, Stephen, with so many teams, especially rookies, uh, not having any auto mode at all, uh, what do you make of this team, and what advice do you have for teams to get autonomous mode going during competition? 
Oh, I'm super impressed with teams like this that are, you know, focused on autonomous already. I mean, they're ahead of us. Like, <laughs> we haven't even started programming <laughs> right. autonomous modes or anything like that. So, I mean, teams, yeah, you go to the regionals, and especially in the early ones you watch, and there's a lot of teams that are just sitting there in autonomous. And, you know, you'd like to see it be better, I guess, if I had advice for teams that were trying to do that. Um, you know, just make sure you've got encoders on your drive and a gyro on there. You know what I mean? Like, that's 90% of all of our autonomous modes is encoder and gyro. And, like, cheesecaking uh, code is the, definitely the easiest thing to cheesecake. Like, if you walk up to a veteran, veteran team, reach out to a veteran team and say, hey, we've got encoders, we've got... A gyro, I mean, I've seen it happen multiple times where a team at a regional will, you know, go from having nothing to having a pretty awesome autonomous mode by the end of the thing and during the span of a regional. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the, I think the biggest thing is, is, regardless of how good your robot is, have an autonomous mode. Make sure you're able to do something because those are really easy points, especially in this year's game where you can just uh, drive up to a defense and you can get points for that. And it's amazing to see how many teams still don't have autonomous. Right. And the one thing I'll say, though, to veteran teams who are well-versed, <laughs> please reach out to these teams and help them with their autonomous mode and get them going. Even if you're playing against them in a the match, you know what? Who cares? You're, you're making the field better as a whole, and that makes those teams better as a whole. Definitely. So here's uh, one more from you. We have uh, Team 1418. It's uh, I believe it's called uh, the team name is Ve Victus out of Virginia. Uh, it's called the Weasel Bot, so you might have seen that post on Cheat Delphi, uh, showing what the power of a little robot uh, scoring robot can do. So they're able to go many different ways, uh, traverse uh, some of the defenses, including the portcullis, and uh, in autonomous, which is quite impressive, and scoring from the neutral zone uh, by going underneath the bar, uh, all in autonomous. And Stephen, here's a good example of a team who is able to uh, be an inspiration for other robots, like the previous team we just saw. Um, how do you see the low bar, low scoring robots fitting into the strategy of Stronghold this year, though? Uh, you know, I hear both sides of it. A lot of people are saying that in the later events that you won't have teams that are not focused on shooting in the high goal. But I don't necessarily agree with that. I might be in the minority there. But uh, I think that a robot like you're looking at right here, 1418, for one thing, that is super impressive. I'm impressed with these guys. Like, that looks like an event winner to me, a future event winner. And I think even late in the season because I don't think that it's going to take an alliance of like three top goal shooters to make it even at championship district championship or championship event. I think that if you got a robot like that one, that's scoring, uh, he has the ability to score in the low goal or can go, you know, steal some balls from the other side, drop them off in your zone kind of thing. I really don't think that you're going to need three high goal shooters. So, yeah, and we talked about this a little bit with uh, Greg Nadell on our last show um, in regards to, you know, what, what will make the Einstein. And I think for a lot of teams is we need to focus on what's going to get you to championships first. And a robot like this, to me, that's a championship robot right there. That's more than easily oh, able to win regionals. And they're having the versatility, I believe, uh, you know, if they're not going to be an alliance captain, they're going to be high on my pick list, absolutely. So uh, early in the year, we discussed a poll – post on Chief Delphi asking how many teams will be going underneath the low bar and uh, nearly 90% of the respondents uh, claim that robot will indeed be able to go underneath the low bar. Now understanding that there could be a significant margin error with the poll you know not every team is pulled was only about uh, I believe about 10% of the field but now that we're on to week 5 of build season uh, what do you believe the percentage of teams uh, will actually be able to go underneath the low bar Stephen? And if you don't mind in addition do you believe that uh, too many teams are sacrificing too much to be a low-bar robot? I think probably, I'm hoping, yeah, I think teams are probably sacrificing a lot to try to go underneath the low-bar, but I'm hoping at this point in the season a lot of teams are realizing that, uh, you know, you can forego going over the low-bar, and it definitely lessens the design challenge that you're working with, I think. I mean, we'd like to be able to go into the low-bar, too, on 987. We still don't have everything on our robot yet, so I don't know if it's going to happen or not. But uh, I think it'll wind up probably being closer to 50-50. Maybe biased on the side of lo lo robots that can go into the low bar, but you got to remember you're looking at Chief Delphi where it's kind of a, I don't want to say, it's the teams that are paying more attention kind of thing. You know what I mean? You're going to get mm -hmm. a bias towards teams that want to be competitive on Chief Delphi, and I think that's why that poll is skewed. Yeah, and there was a um, interesting... Uh, a couple interesting follow-ups. I know uh, Joe Joe posts on Chief Delphi uh, talking 
about one was the Karthik reaction uh, to it about uh, he's concerned and what what terrified. does that mean? Yes, terrified. Thank you. Terrified. Yes. <laughs> and what, what does that mean exactly? Uh, so Nick, uh, in your in your opinion, what is what is Karthik terrified of? You know, I'm gonna have to agree with. I I don't remember who posted. It. I'll see if I can find it here. But they were discussing like the the lack of functionality in a lot of the, these robots that you're gonna see because they're gonna they're gonna see oh hey everyone else is doing the low bar uh, we we got to do it too or you know it's always there so why not use it and then you're gonna see a lot of people not able to start crossing defenses because they they have to suffer in drive trains or manipulators just to fit underneath that low bar. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, and. and... Stephen, to your credit as well, too, talking about with the sacrifices that a, a team would have to make. It's yeah, you guys are both right. It'll be interesting to see um, once we have to get the competition, our teams really going to be able to do everything they think they can. And we we know the answer is no, right? Every single year, teams uh, will overestimate, including our own teams have all done that at some point in time, right? Uh, but it'll be really interesting to see in general over the whole field of how many teams are going to be sacrificing a lot to go low bar. Uh, and I'm curious to see, you know, now that we are at week five, how many teams have switched their strategies around? I know a, a couple that I've talked to have looked at, uh, they went from low bar and now they're like, nope, a lot of the field's doing it or nope, it's it's sacrificing too much. Uh, we're going to be a high robot and focus on having a better trajectory shooting the ball or something like that. So uh, rounding up our headlines uh, today, uh, Automation Direct, they're the company behind this year's game animation, they gave some really cool insight uh, to what into what went into the 2016 Stronghold animation. And here's some interesting facts to lay out for you. Uh, this team here had a little bit over four months to deliver the animation from uh, the day the, ga the game concept was revealed and uh, didn't even deliver the final animation until December 27th. They claimed they had to work all the way through Christmas to make sure it was delivered on time. Uh, it's a really cool animation and I think one of the best we've seen in a long time. It took over 2,000 hours uh, with a render farm of seven PCs, of which most of these PCs had uh, 64 core uh, CPUs on them. Uh, so the really cool thing about all this, though, is that the lead uh, CG artist, his name is uh, Chris uh, Folia, got his animation start in first by submitting for the animation award back in 2005 from Team 1746. And Stronghold, this video that we have, is now the uh, most viewed video on the FRC team's global YouTube page with over 200,000 views. We haven't even started the competition season yet, and it's already obliterated every single other one out there. So teams, don't forget, too, that new this year, uh, sponsored by Automation Direct, uh, they're having a new award um, called the Dave Lavery Animation Award that you can submit on Automation Direct's website. Uh, the deadline is on April 3rd, so if you're interested in getting the animation and you've been inspired by what uh, Automation Direct has done, make sure you take a look and uh, submit an animation for it. There's some cool prizes that they have as well. And don't forget that every year can still submit a safety animation. It's a little bit too late this year, uh, but make sure, uh, you know, if you're interested in that, if you've got students who are interested, tell them to give it a shot. There's some free software out there for you to do as well. Uh, Steven, has, has your team done animation anytime recently, or has it been quite a while for high rollers? It's been a long time for us. You know, we actually, I used to play around with it back when I was in high school, and I'm not sure if we yeah, ever submitted or anything for it since I'm terrible at it, but, you know, it was something I played around with when I was in high school. But, no, we haven't. We should get into it. We've got a lot of different kind of kids, you know, on the team in recent years that that might be their thing, and it's kind of, you know, something we need to push them to do because, you know, it appeals to a different sector of the students there. Yeah, and I think that kind of offers, you know, there might be a lot of students who haven't really identified what path they want to go through on a team because when you first start on a team, that can be a very uh, yeah, intimidating yeah. experience, right? Yeah, for sure. All right, so that's going to be a look at uh, some of our headlines going in, going through the first robotics community in the last couple of weeks. Let's take a break uh, to remind you that this episode of Recap is brought to you by Anymark. So competition season, it's almost here. And have you checked your batteries to make sure that they are competition ready? So don't get stranded in the middle of a match. Check out the Battery Beak, uh, made in partnership by Cross the Road Electronics. This battery load tester is compatible with FRC batteries and measures uh, internal resistance, state of charge, and determines the overall health of your battery. The uh, internal resistant measurement is really useful for teams in determining if any bad cells are present. Uh, when the battery beak is used to track uh, a battery's internal resistance over time, it is possible to determine when a battery uh, when to take a battery out of service uh, before a failure does occur. 
Uh, we use Battery Beak uh, several times a year on our team uh, to make sure that we have uh, only the best batteries in a robot, and you should too. Uh, combined with Animark's five-star service, you'll be glad that you picked up this great product. So head on over to Animark.com today to pick up the Battery Beak, and we thank Animark for their support of Fun Recap. So it's uh, that time of the week where we check in on teams from the FRC community to see how they're uh, tackling the Stronghold Challenge. And if you're interested in appearing on the show uh, to talk about your team, drop us an email at firstupdatesnow at gmail.com or shoot us a post on Facebook or tweet us on Twitter. So we're going to get our first team on here. Uh, the uh, first team we're going to have is going to be a rookie from Florida who's been looking to make a big impact. Uh, this team even released a chairman's video earlier this year uh, I'm sorry, earlier last week, uh, even though they can't qualify for tournaments, it did as well. So please welcome Michael from FRC 5872 Wirecats. Welcome to the show, Michael. Hi, thank you for having me. Glad to have you on. So let's start from the beginning. You're a rookie team this year. Uh, what led to your team uh, forming, and uh, how'd you move forward from there? Well, um, for the past four years, our school has been competing in FTC competitions. We started from a really humble FTC team called the Wizards of Odd, uh, team number 6322. And we were only about 8 to 10 people large in our robotics program, and we didn't uh, have too many materials. We started with a very uh, uh, low amount of resources. And then now, after four years of building on what we had, we now have four FR FTC teams and about 70 people in our robotics program. So wow. we've been increasing uh, a huge amount, spreading word around our school. Uh, we just had a freshman orientation today, so we keep getting more and more students that are interested in engineering so that we can enlarge what we have and uh, really get the word of first out to more people. And last year was actually our first year branding ourselves as the Wired Cats because we had our first two years where we just came up with clever names that we thought were uh, pretty cool, and now we branded ourselves as the Wired Cats. And um, earlier this year, actually um, towards the end of last year, we were looking for a new challenge, and we had a lot of FRC teams reaching out to us and uh, giving us a hands-on experience with them to see what FRC was like, and we really wanted to get into that and try this new challenge. So with their help and also with the help of great sponsors like Motorola Solutions, we were able to get our team running this year. That's awesome. It sounds like you guys are off to a great start, uh, not just with the robot, um, but also uh, just as an outreach program as well, too. But let's talk about the robot right now. Um, so. Um, how's it going so far with your team this season, and uh, where are you guys at, and how are you tackling the Stronghold Challenge? Well, so far, uh, we had to go through the transformation from FTC-type materials with everything already pre-made over to this F the new FRC technical uh, aspects. So it was really cool being able to change to this and see the new type of technology we get to work with, and now also the new timing with the six-week build season. season. Sure. We're now limited to that amount of time, and we have extra long build sessions. Team members are coming together more than ever to work together and really make a lot of progress on the robot. And not only students, but also parents and mentors are coming together. Uh, we have awesome parents helping us make defenses so that once we get our robot running, we can start practicing, and we're also getting a castle together to be able to start shooting in. And We've also been following along with the past challenges of FRC, such as Aerial Assist and Recycle Rush last year, and we're extremely happy that we started this year with Stronghold because it's such an entertaining and awesome game. So many things going on at once that we have to really uh, plan in advance in order to get uh, where you want to be. And understanding the new rules was a big challenge for us, too, because... Uh, it was so different. So the first thing we did on kickoff was just read through the entire game manual step by step, uh, rotating around our entire team and getting people to see uh, the differences between FTC and FRC so we can really get a hold for this and have a good time with it as we go through. Once we did that, we just prioritized our different, different components that we wanted to make for our uh, Robot, such as uh, wanting to go over defenses was our biggest priority and after that being able to shoot the ball into the high goal and also to look to the low goal and other cases where it, maybe there's defense in the way. Sure. And once we did that, we just started strategizing with different scenarios that we may have. And our biggest motto this year with, with FRC, since we're just starting, we wanted to make sure all our mechanisms were kept simple and still functional. So we tried keeping the least amount of moving parts on our shooter or on any, any components we plan on making in the future in order to 
being able to have a better time getting things together and also be more efficient in the process. Very cool. Um, and you mentioned before that you guys, uh, you, you have some FTC teams, so definitely you've been networking uh, and getting programs started where you are. Have you had an opportunity uh, to network or talk to uh, other teams, not either in Florida or in the FRC community in general? Well, uh, yes, we actually have been communicating with plenty of FRC teams. Uh, uh, the Bot Cats team 3653 helped us out a lot in getting, getting experience before even starting this season. And other teams have helped us in the preseason in getting parts and getting knowledge of the different software that we would have to be using for the FRC season are uh, teams such as 744 Shark Attack and sure. 5410 the uh, Eagle Bodies from North Broward Prep here in South Florida. And internationally, we've also been able to reach out to a Team Mexico, Team 3478, and we were able to have a Skype call with them and have a, a really great time interacting with them and getting their experiences so we have a really efficient uh, FRC rookie season. That's awesome, and that's that's huge as a team, you know, as any team, not just a rookie team to do that. And, and speaking about that as well, too, the transition, uh, as we're showing right now, uh, we got to talk about this uh, chairman's video uh, that you released a little bit ago. Uh, what led you to doing this, and uh, how do you feel the experience will uh, give you a leg up to the other 11 rookies in the South Florida Regional for the Rookie All-Star Award? And Nick, if you can show that video. Well, um, as rookies, we really wanted to establish uh, the professional aspect of our team. So we wanted to tell a story of the past four years of our, of our robotics program, all that we've gone through starting with a really small FTC team and expanding to several teams not only within our high school but also incorporating students from a local middle school and also reaching out uh, not only locally but internationally uh, to other students so that we can benefit people who are underserved in other countries such as Colombia and Peru which we are making initiatives for right now and also be able to stay within our community and get students at a younger age prepared for what they would be doing in FTC and FRC once they come to our school in, uh, in our STEM Academy. And we may be rookies to FRC, but we think of ourselves as veterans with FIRST. So we really wanted to show this video so people would see, yes, we are just starting this new competition in FRC, but we know what we're doing and we really want to be able to motivate other students and maybe other rookies that are just getting started with FIRST uh, as a whole to go out and make similar programs so that not only we can benefit as students in FIRST, but also younger students can benefit at early ages and get ahead on what we we're doing now. Sorry, my mic just muted. Uh, that's awesome, man. Uh, and it, I think you made a good point that you might be rookies in FRC, but you're not rookies the first. And that's that's so true. And you guys have done so much already. Uh, so, Michael uh, from Wirecast, we wish you guys the best of luck uh, in the uh, season. Good luck at the South Florida Regional, and best of luck on uh, trying to get that rookie All Star award this year. Hopefully, we see you at championships. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. You got it. You take care now. You too. Uh, our next team is going to be FRC 3132 down under from Sydney, Australia. 3132 was the winner of the Tesla division last year and is uh, attempting to be the first non-North American Hall of Fame team. So calling us from tomorrow is second year mechanical student. Uh, am I pronounced? Is it Rui? How do you pronounce that? Uh, it's Rui. Rui. I was pretty close there. And 12-year uh, first veteran Sarah, who's a strategy and media mentor on 3132. Uh, welcome uh, to you both, and thank you for coming on the show during the middle of your day. Uh, thank you for having us. It's our pleasure to be here. So uh, 2015 uh, was a huge year uh, for Thunder Down Under. You guys had 13 awards, and I thought we did well with uh, – we had seven or eight, but 13 awards. Uh, at regionals, you won chairmans, engineering inspiration. You had two Dean's List winners, two regional finalists, and even a Woody Flowers finalist. And at championships, you guys were a uh, division winner in Tesla, as we mentioned, and uh, won the Engineering Inspiration Award. Uh, what led to such a huge year for Thunder Down Under? You know, uh, we look at our season and we ask the same question. Um, it was just an amazing year for us. It was our dream year. And I think it was really the build up from the very beginning. You know, since we began in 2009, we've had such incredible support for our program and first in Australia. If it weren't for all the teams in New England who helped us that rookie year, I, I don't know where we would be today. So I think it's just standing on the shoulders of giants here in Sydney. All right, so Rhea, what's going on with uh, with Thunder Downer this year? How are you guys uh, taking on the Stronghold Challenge, and where's your progress at right now? Oh, yeah. So our strategy involves being able to do everything. <laughs> uh, Fair enough. 
Uh, so we want to be able to do like all of the defenses and score into both of the goals, but we're going to primarily focus on scoring into the high goal and crossing and being and crossing all of the defenses in our game. Okay. Um, so are you are you guys? Uh, I don't know if I heard this. Are you guys a high bot, a low bot? Are you going underneath the low bar? Uh, so we're going to be able to go underneath the low bar is the plan okay. and score into the high goal into the high goal. So what is your what's your plan for packaging? You said you want to do everything and that's fair enough. A lot of uh, high end teams want to do and be able to accomplish that. But how are you guys packaging everything uh, into such a small space? Uh, so we're going um, obviously low enough to fit under the low bar and we've got six inch tires. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, eight inch pneumatic wheels. Sure. Um, and we don't actually have very much ground clearance, but uh, we've tested with all of the different uh, defenses and we can get over them with our current drive base. I think one of the other things that's been really key for us is we have a lot of mentors with FTC experience. So three former members of FTC Team 4251 Cougar Robotics are mentors on our team. Okay. And they obviously have a lot of packaging problems in FTC. So having that experience has really been helpful this season. Very cool. So last year was the premiere of the Australian Regional, which has got to be great for you guys, right? You can actually go to something local for once. <laughs> so I'm sure that's, that's nice to have. But uh, how has this event uh, helped spawn growth of FIRST in Australia? Uh, so I think it's really helped. We can, uh, I personally know a team, Project the Cephalus, that I was on for a few years, uh, a year. Um, and they started a FRC team because they could actually make it to a regional and didn't have to travel overseas. Yeah, just the exposure of the event. It was a massive media event here in Australia. We had national coverage on several TV stations, several major newspapers, and it really helped get the word out there more in the community in Australia, which was fantastic. Really, really cool. And uh, hopefully, uh, what, what week is the Australia Regional this year? Uh, we are week three, once again. Week three, awesome. So make sure you do check that out. Uh, on the Blue Alliance, make sure you head over there and look at that. Uh, so you guys have had a lot of initiatives going on uh, in Australia for Thunder Down Under uh, and even beyond uh, in regard to not just FIRST but helping STEM programs grow. So what's, uh, what's next for Thunder Down Under as you guys strive to uh, get to that championship chairman's mark? Uh, I guess one of our big projects at the moment um, is Robots in the Outback. You can follow it on Facebook. We've had some posts on Cheap Delphi. But what we've done is we've gotten a number of our mentors, as well as mentors from other teams, um, some even flying over from the United States, and a senior mentor, Andy Marshall, from Iowa. And they've come here, and they're going on a road show around Australia helping start teams. Well, teams that have already started and registered, they're going and visiting them for two days, helping them get a driving robot. And the stories and the impact that the program is having is absolutely incredible. Uh, you know, every day I'm helping manage the program, and every day I wake up to more emails in my inbox about the great things that are going on. So that's just been our big thing at the moment. Um, other things that are going on, uh, lots of stuff going on in China. Be sure to keep an eye out. I think we're going to see great things from that region, as well as FRC in India with them coming to the Sydney Regional this wow. year for the first time. So um, lots of growth, trying to support everyone internationally through all the challenges. That's really awesome. Steven, you got any questions for our Australian friends? Um, does the water go down the opposite direction in the toilet when you flush it down there? <laughs> <laughs> um, this is so I used to live in the United States. So when I moved here, I was very curious about that. It does not. Um, it ah, turns okay. out that the water, the way it comes into the bowl is actually more important than the effect of the earth spinning. So if you had a just a pot of water and drain that it would go down the opposite direction but in the toilet it goes the same way way, way to spin that into a science related <laughs> answer that i think yes, you handled exactly. as well as you possibly could <laughs> awesome well thank you to you both uh sarah and Ree from uh thunder down under good luck to you guys and uh we'll be watching you on the australian regional thank you and we'll also be at week one minnesota northern lights so absolutely too. yeah have fun with that uh nice cold blizzardy winter up there <laughs> take care guys good luck to you and now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time uh, for what you've all been waiting for. Now get ready for Ryan's awesome Einstein strategies of the week.
denied. Rejected. All right, so for those of you listening, uh, what just happened is we pretty much just saw the uh, defensive version of Air Jordan flying over the ramp of an opponent's robot and uh, lodging themselves into their own tower to block the opponents from scoring. Uh, and I guess we'll just have to pretend they blocked all the openings. Sounds legit to me. Uh, so, all right, Nick, uh, which team uh, do you believe will utilize this strategy uh, to help them get themselves on Einstein? The uh, the blocker robot there, uh, I'm going to give a little shout-out to uh, Texplosion. Uh, they they've been a really good defensive bot for the last couple of years here, and uh, I think we competed with them uh, a couple of years ago, and they're still pretty good. So that's that's my vote for for those guys right there. Yeah, and they've definitely been known as a a high end defensive team for many years. Uh, Stephen, who's your pick and why? Uh, I'm gonna go with 207, the Metal Crafters uh, out of LA, because uh, their drivetrain in 2012. Last time we had a similar, you know. Uh, obstacle to get over they dukes have hazarded over the bump you know going each direction they have to fly a little bit further i think to get up into the tower but not much from what they were doing in 2012 not much difference and uh, i have to say according to the chat i think it will be legal so we'll have to see uh <laughs> to me uh i gotta pick a uh, team what pops in my head is 4334 ata uh, at all, out of Alberta, Canada, and the reason I picked them is I, I think about uh, back in 2012 in their rookie year, they had that little, small, tiny robot that uh, the way they played defense really well and did it so effectively, it got them a nine stand, which is picking up balls from the opponent's side and steal them over. So I could see them uh, building something like this and just completely reject the competition. So before we uh, get more into further dis discussions about Stronghold, uh, let's take a break to thank Audible for their support of Recap. Audible is offering all listeners of the show uh, an incredible deal that will also help support us and make our shows move forward. Uh, first off, head on over to firstupdatesnow.com and click the Audible link on our page. Audible is offering a free audiobook with 30 days to try out their service. Now, uh, I'm a huge fan of Game of Thrones, and to be honest, uh, as I mentioned on uh, the last show of Spotlight, I just don't have time to read it all. Uh, so on my commute, I've been reading well listening to a game of thrones uh the book number one on my commute to work every day and it's awesome to get uh all the additional content that i missed on the show i'm about a quarter of the way through and i'm absolutely loving it it's so cool to be able to uh, listen to all that stuff that the show might not have covered or might have done a little bit differently so if you want to support uh our shows get a free audiobook to listen to go to firstupdatesnow.com forward slash audible or click on the graphic on our site you can cancel any time or if you love it and i think you will uh continue on to your next adventure a huge thank thank you to audible for their support of first update now shows like recap so uh we got to get into a little bit more about stronghold and I really dig deep a little bit more into 987 as well too so i gotta ask you steven let's start off right off the bat how was 987 approaching stronghold uh what are they Without getting too in the detail, uh, what are <laughs> seven uh, looking at doing this year? Sure, yeah, we won't give away any, you know, spoilers or anything like that. But uh, we're, like I said, we're trying to go low. We, I seriously don't know if we're going to be able to pull it off yet because we want to hang as well. And I think those are two challenges that are kind of, you know, in a, in opposition to each other. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, we're focusing, you know, like a lot of teams that are looking at late in the season. We're looking at. Uh, what's going to be the limiting factor, you know, on the highest levels of play? And it comes down to shooting. I mean, you can only break down the defenses so many times and stuff like that. What's going to set it apart is shooting. So we're looking at shooting a lot of balls, a lot of boulders, pardon me, as fast as we can, you know, into the high goals. So I don't know. We'll see how it turns out. Like I said, we feel a little bit behind compared to some of these videos you've been posting with these teams with full working robots. We're not there yet. So we'll uh, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, no kidding, man. Uh, with with the videos some teams have been posting, I, I look, I'm like, man, where are we going to be at? Um, and just, you know, just keep grinding at it, right? And, you know, we, both of our teams have been around uh, long enough to know that uh, no matter where your team is at, if your team's not quite at what that team was, just keep pushing forward, keep working hard, and you'll get there. So, uh, 97, uh, you guys have had four Einstein appearances, very jealous since 2007, uh, including being the world champions in 2007. Uh, what do you feel leads to 97's uh, continued success uh, for getting on the Einstein? Uh, I think we're just really fortunate in that the first community out here is small. Like I said, it's hard to sustain teams out here in the desert. But uh, a lot of our mentors have been with the team. I mean, like I am a prime example. I came back like 
uh, we're, we're kind of different than most teams, and there are a lot of our mentors are teachers. So they sure. were teachers at the school. Um, I mean, maybe not different from a lot of teams, but it's just kind of something that we talk to a lot of teams, and maybe they have more outside engineering mentors. We definitely have those two, and they're awesome. We have some Jedi Masters that are definitely – you know, training oh, where, us where do I get the, those? <laughs> you talk to talk to Mark Jones, talk to Trent, talk to those guys. They know what's up. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I think just having that group of people that's st stuck with the team for so long, it's made alumni want to come back. And now we have alumni helping out and stuff like that. And I mean, I we just you know, it takes a little bit of luck to be successful. But once you you have some success with something, it just kind of breeds success. You get people that want to keep coming back that's what i think is you know helped us keep doing what we're doing hopefully we continue to carry it through we're just very lucky yeah take care of your mentors right yeah absolutely yeah you got to get that uh if you get that good base of mentors that i always equivalate when mentors are happy students are happy and when students are happy mentors are happy right it definitely so, it goes hand in hand yeah so finding that that right balance which is not easy to do but finding that right balance will definitely help you out um, so I'd like to ask you a, a bit of questions. Some of these aren't necessarily uh, specific for Stronghold, but maybe some things in general, uh, tips to help out teams as they start to get into competition season. Uh, so one of the questions, and I think this has been a bit of a controversial subject over many years, but accepted in many uh, cases as well, is stop build day. Uh, what is your opinion on this? Stop build day, really stop build day for teams? I don't believe that for most teams it's stop build day anymore. Uh, I mean, with the withholding rules and everything like that, and then I don't know. I just I don't. It's definitely not for us. And uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know. It's I just think that most people are working on something after build day. You got your withholding allowance. They you may as well take advantage of it. Yeah, and, and continue to have new iterations of your robot, right? Yeah, that's, absolutely. That's something that uh, as we talk about competition readiness for your team uh, as we approach the competition season uh, there's many areas the team should focus on on getting ready to compete and uh, having iterations of the robot is one of those uh, so what can teams do you know between stop build day and their first uh, regional which uh, unless you're the week 0.5 you have at least a week uh, to do something uh, what can teams do between stop build day and their first competition to get their robot more competition ready uh, I mean, if you're fortunate enough to be able to have a practice bot, then you can obviously practice driving. I mean, you can have the best robot out there on the field, and you're not going to win if you can't drive the thing. So I think practicing driving, coding is a big deal. Code can be written, uh, you know, between the stop build day and your regional. It doesn't weigh anything. Um, trying to think of what else. Even teams that don't have a practice bot, this is something that we did. I mean, we were we we're lucky now in that we have the resources we can build a second robot, but it wasn't always that way. We would, uh, you know, have a practice chassis, like just a something basic chassis to practice driving around the field that hopefully was somewhat similar. But, you know, half the battle is getting that driver to, you know, be able to know what it's going to be like out there on the field driving around. Yeah, and having... Um... You mentioned teams without a, a practice, a, an extra robot or a practice robot of any sort. I think a lot of teams um, don't necessarily identify. That they believe that they have to have an exact identical copy of the robot. And while uh, that can be very important and very beneficial, just providing an opportunity for your drivers to practice driving along or to give your programmers an opportunity uh, after stop build day to to work on something. So if they have to retrofit it at competition, they can do that is, is very, very important as well. And maybe it's not in the bag for a first year team, but if you think about it after your first year, you should have uh, extra dry bases or some sort of robot you can drive around and retrofit to this year's game. I know one of the sure. things that, that we've done on 2826 is uh, we took a, uh, actually won the drive frame from a couple of years ago and just put some pneumatic wheels on it to try driving over obstacles. So there's interesting things you can do with that as well. Sure, and withholding mechanisms, I mean, even in 13, I think, uh, in 2013, we didn't or we didn't have a practice shooter. The shooter that we shot with, you know, in the in our at our shop was the one that was on the competition robot, weighed, you know, like four or five pounds or something like that. Something crucial to the game like that, you can withhold that, you know, bring it to your first yeah. region. Well, and, and another thing, too, with competitions is uh, I think a lot of teams tend to underestimate the pit space that they're given, right? You're given that usually 10 by 10 area, sometimes less, 
uh, that the teams have, especially championships, right? Uh, right. So sometimes, sometimes less than that. But uh, 97, you guys have a very nice pit. And I think more than anything, not just the aesthetics to it, the organization of it is important. Uh, so what do you guys do and what advice do you have for other teams in regards to getting your pit competition ready? Um, yeah, I mean, you can swing by our pit for sure. It's, it's organized and everything. It's not an expense the pit. We buy, uh, you know, like the cheapo Home Depot shelves are made of plastic and we set those up and we don't bring a big pit crate to like championship or anything like that. We're fortunate to have a lot of regionals around us that we can drive to. So we're able to, you know, at our close regionals bring a fancier pit, but uh, yeah, just organization is a big deal. If you can't find anything in your pit and there's five minutes before the next match and you need that eighth inch Allen wrench and you can't find it, you know yeah. what I mean? It's a huge problem. So I, I don't know. We keep it simple, definitely. I wouldn't try to bring – some teams have got some really cool pits and have a different approach to it than we do. But if you, yeah, swing by our pit, we've got just shelves and drawers and little crates and stuff like that. Just keep it as organized as you can. I mean, it's not – uh, only good for your robot it's safe you know what i mean and it, well, another big thing i'll say is get some f carpeting or flooring or we got those form foam tiles on the yeah, floor fatigue mats right standing in there for three yeah. days on that hard concrete floor you, maybe the kids won't feel it but i feel it so, <laughs> uh, so another thing uh, we talked about this uh, a couple weeks ago we showcased one of the scouting programs that uh, a team out of indiana had uh but but scouting is a huge factor. We talked about the importance that it's going to have this year in Stronghold because it is going to be very, very important. Uh, but as we get into the competition season, uh, what, what should teams look at, you know, for scouting? Not every team's able to do their own scouting program per se, but um, what can they do or what do you guys do in 987 uh, to handle scouting? What process do you go through? Uh, we got a team of kids that that is what they do. They really dig scouting, and they sit in the stands, and they like watching the matches. I envy them because I don't get to see as many matches yeah. as they do. But, uh, I mean, it's cool. you got to celebrate it. I think in the past on our team, scouting was kind of a, like, oh, you know, you're going to go scout. You're not going to be in the pit. It was like a punishment type of thing. But you get the, you get the best of what you celebrate, and if you celebrate scouting, uh, you're going to have good scouting data. They come up with metrics, and, you know, they've got – fancy excel spreadsheets and you know data entry plans to get the data in there while staying within the rules i don't know if you 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 well you were sat next to us at champs you saw the whole wired yeah. monstrosity that they had last year <laughs> we're gonna try doing phones this year but they used a wired network you know so we're not broadcasting anything wi-fi i think they've tried bluetooth and stuff like that before but uh there was an interesting thread on delphi a few weeks ago and people were talking about pit scouting and how it's worthless and um Eric from Wave actually he was uh, he was chiming in on there, uh, talking about you know yeah pit scouting does have some value you can walk around the pits check out you know the other team's robots and ask them questions and you know one of those what big ones last year was were you willing to add stuff to your robot or how much did you weigh that kind of thing, but uh, more than that we do pit scout for sure we walk around our students walk around and they're looking to see are there wires hanging to the drivetrain that kind of thing not because. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like if you didn't have a great robot and there's wires hanging into the drivetrain, but we want to be able to, you know, if you break, are you going to be able to fix you in time and stuff like that? So uh, I don't know. It's complicated. It's a, definitely a big part of the strategy. You, I'd like to have you elaborate a little bit more. You talked about getting the, the celebrate the scouting, right? The getting the kids engaged into scouting. What, what do you do to do that? What's the, what is 987's magic key to get kids really excited about scouting? Oh, we have a scouting meeting. It happens on Friday night. Uh, there's pizza involved and lots of Mountain Dew. And, you know, the kids are, like, fighting, standing up for their team. Like, if we're in a picking situation, I definitely want these guys because they're awesome. Here's the data on them. You know what I mean? And uh, it's just they really love the scouting meeting. They like to fight for the team that they want because they have direct say in it. The, I spend most of my time in the pit along with the drive team. And we have no idea. We, have, You know what I mean? If we're lucky we've seen some of the teams, but especially at championship where the division is huge, it's all rests on their shoulders. And it's you got to make it an important job because it is. If you make it a punishment, if you make it something that you just send kids to go do kind of thing, then you're going to get what you get out of it. Yeah, right. The quality you get is definitely going to be some mm -hmm. if you do something like that because you can give them the best software in the world, but if they're not engaged, if they're not paying attention, you're not going to get what you want out of it. Right. I mean, they'll make – They'll make bets on matches, and you know what I mean? They yeah. have a good time with it. So it's, like I said, you got to make it fun. And it is fun. I'm jealous of them, honestly. I wish I could sit and scout. And I do. I do get the chance to, but not as often as I like. 
Yeah, and I and I hear you from um, many of the competitions that I, I go to. I'm an MC at, and so I get a you know perspective down on the field, but it's really hard to see everything that's going on versus in the stands when you get that uh, bird's eye view, be able to see every single match. Uh, I have to admit, I'm a little envious of something like that. So, um, what about uh, some? some of the awards i mean 97's won many chairman's awards uh you guys are also competing uh year after year for championship chairman's but um between chairman's and just talking to judges in the pits when that uh encounter happens because judges come down in the pits and talk to you uh what do you recommend for teams in regards to getting ready uh for different types of awards at a competition uh there's two approaches to that well there's more than two approaches to that but there's two kind of mindsets on our team is Back when we were smaller and there was like a chairman subsection of the team, um, we would have a person that worked on the chairman's award, worked on our outreach, knew what was going on, hang out in the pit so that they could talk to the judges. But as our team has evolved and, you know, it's uh, we've gotten so many more kids involved with it, we feel now that every kid should have to know. Every student in the pit should have to know everything about the robot, everything about chairman's. Uh, everything about our outreach and what we've done and so that's what we tend to do now we'll even right. do practice judging like you know uh we'll have sponsors come out to the to the shop and ask the kids about the robot or we'll make the chairman's presenters present their chairman's award in the middle of a crowded restaurant or something like that <laughs> you know keep everybody on their toes because you know you never know who you could be talking to whether it is a chairman's judge whether it's somebody that could be giving you an internship later on in life uh you know could be somebody that makes a difference yeah and that that's really cool that you guys uh that you have every single student be aware of that and that's a hard thing to do right because they get every student completely aware of you know the chairman's aspect the the, the entire robot as a whole especially when students tend to specialize in things so right it is tough it's got to be a cultural thing like the team has to understand that uh you know spreading the message of first and outreach is, is just as important as you know machining uh, a part or something like that you got to being being special being a specialist in something is definitely important but knowing what your team stands for and what they do is also you know important yeah very wise words words of wisdom there uh anything else uh that you want to give in regards to how what teams can do to get themselves competition ready um let's see competition ready uh, i can't think of anything directly offhand we covered scouting we covered the you know the whole getting ready after stop build day and stuff like that um getting some sleep and stuff like that yeah, that's right. the biggest thing at competitions our team has a tough time with it as i'm sure every team does it's just a natural thing you can't sleep that wednesday night before thursday or the thursday night before friday but uh you know we've had kids falling asleep in the pit and stuff like that before and it's just like get some sleep you know i don't know what you got to do to do it but that's yeah. a big thing your physical health plays into it for sure too well, and I think that's a big thing that, you know, kids and mentors alike, right? They're they're out. This is kind of a vacation almost at the same time. I mean, it's a working vacation. Right. Uh, but having that mindset of saying, you know what, I have a job to do uh, with my team. And if I, you know, stay up way too late up night and partying or doing a, whatever the kids do these days, uh, <laughs> that, you know, you, you might fail that job and you could let your team down. And that's something that you know, as a student and as a mentor, uh, that, you got to realize that, you know, you're here to do something and to accomplish a certain type of goal, whatever that is for your team, uh, and make sure that you're uh, in the best condition possible that you can be. Yes, it's okay. You know, I, I stay up, uh, you know, during the night of a competition, you know, strategizing, thinking about things in my head, but you got to get that good night's sleep to make sure you're ready to go. Yeah, absolutely. Wholeheartedly agree. Uh, Nick, you've been on the lookout uh, for uh, some new uh, out-of-the-box topics uh, to talk about uh, on Recap and uh, within the FRC community. So what's on the lookout for today? Today's uh, On the Lookout segment, we're going to discuss uh, some cool and funny names from rookie teams this year. So uh, okay. my f <laughs> what was that, Tyler? I said, okay, we got some new rookies, huh? Yep, yep. quite a few rookies this year. So I ended up uh, going through the list and, and just – kind of checking it out and see what we get so uh stemming from our, our our hometown area of the midwest here we have 5998 earl and the chill bots they're from minnesota pretty creative name all right following that one we have 5940 bread bread team bread yep hopefully i wonder what the acronym is for that that's interesting <laughs> And then 6174, uh, unsure from California. I'm not unsure if they're from California. They're just unsure from California. So their team name is unsure. Yes. 
I wonder if they I just think. went in the temps and they're like, what is your team name? Just like, I'm not sure. <laughs> we're, we're on they sure. They forgot to change it. <laughs> <laughs> One of the more uh, creative ones I saw was actually from Australia. They're called uh, Weewa. Yep, Weewa. And I'm so, sure somebody can probably look up what a Weewa is and let us know. <laughs> I think it's actually their hometown name. Oh, okay. So that's that's very interesting, uh, especially from outside of Australia looking in. And uh, my my favorite one from the rookies this year is I from Quebec. They are Team I. Team I. Yep, okay. this is their web page. It is the square root of negative one equals I. That is their home page. By Very far the best. Very informative, uh, yes. Yes, <laughs> yes. Pretty creative awesome. there. And then I got one honorable mention. Uh, they were a rookie team last year. Unfortunately, they're not competing this year. Don't know why. We should really reach out to them. But it's 55-37. Dia and the Brobots feet Jay Quellen from Iowa. Okay. <laughs> well, if uh, Nick will keep you on the lookout for for other things uh, going on there. Uh, and uh, if uh, you have uh, some team names that you thought were interesting go ahead and uh, comment uh, or let us know in Facebook or Twitter uh, and there was definitely a couple other cool ones uh, Ren's uh, talking about mitochondria uh, from China there's definitely some uh, new Chinese teams coming into play uh, so make sure you uh, uh, check those out as well too uh, and if you have other topics you want to talk about or if you find other cool names in the FRC community like I said let us know and we'll talk about it on the next show of recap so as a last subject uh, something to bring into as we're talking about team names Stephen uh, is the importance of a team's name. Uh, to you, is, is the team name really important? And if so, uh, what does it mean both to the FRC community and to the general community? Uh, I think team names definitely are important. We're, we started off as a different team name. I, I don't know if you guys know that, but we were Ultimus no. Acumen in 2002 and 2003 when I was on the team. We decided that we were going to these competitions and we were the only team there from Las Vegas. And we were impressed by some of the teams that had, you know, an image like uh, they're not around anymore, but a great team was uh, Team 64 out of Arizona, the Gila Monsters. We'd go to those competitions and they just had a great brand. And, you know, you just wanted to be a fan of that team. And so we changed our name to the High Rollers, had a Vegas theme, and uh, we've stuck with it ever since. That's what people, it, it just stuck. It's, and that's what people know us as now. And so, and it gives, uh, yeah, it's important, just like I was talking with the mentors and stuff like that from before, the continuity, keeping everything the same, and you've got, you know, your brand that people like, not only outside entities, but you as a team. So I think it's very important. Yeah, and, and coming from a, a marketing background that I'm in, to me, it's, it's all about positioning. And what does that mean is when, you know, if you were to mention, you know, uh, high rollers, for example, what do you think about when you think of high rollers? And to me, I think of, you know, a very high level team and being able to, you know, when you, there's been a few different threads that say like list all the team names that you can, right. And you will see the continual same amount of teams pop up more and more and more. And does performance have a lot to do with that? Absolutely. But having a recognizable name as well too, to me, uh, makes a big deal of that there are some very interesting names and, uh, maybe some that I wouldn't be, uh, very confident in approaching sponsors with. Uh, for example, you know, if you're going to go out there, you no, know, it's up to you if uh, how professional you want your name to be too. But, you know, thinking about not just in the FRC community, but when you're going to the general public as well, uh, you know, is your team name necessarily appropriate uh, for what you're trying to convey, what your message is? And it could be a, a funky, funny name, and that's okay as long as it's the message that you want to get across uh, to the community at large as well. So, all right, everybody, that's all we're going to have tonight for recap. Stephen McKinney, FRC 987, the High Rollers. Thank you so much for coming on to recap. Oh, uh, to thank give us you your guys for having me. Yeah, man. This was uh, awesome. Uh, yeah, you, you did fantastic. Exciting. What's going on in your life, and uh, where can people find you? Oh, uh, you know what's going on in my life right now. Same thing that's going on in all you What's guys. that? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a boat season. Ah. Uh, yeah, I said this is the earliest I got to get away, you know, in a little while, so I definitely uh, appreciate being out here. You can find me on Facebook. Uh, I kind of keep track of the team's Twitter more than Good my point. own, but I'm on there at MC High Rollers, so um yeah that's it thanks for having me this was awesome yeah i'd love to have you man and, and i'd love to have you on again another time us uh, and especially as we start to see the success that high rollers has as well uh, i'd also like to thank our predict our producer uh nick olson for making recap a great show uh nick thanks again for uh, another fantastic job what's going on in your world and in the world of wave robotics uh work like usual and robots afterwards so 
pretty much four hours of sleep a night, like uh, like the rest of us and uh, yeah. us mentors. <laughs> um, robot wise, I was uh, told I should give a little teaser for FRC community tonight. So here it is. There you go. That's your teaser. Um, if you want to look uh, look back on our videos, you can see the rest of it. Um, Do you mind describing it a little bit, Nick, for our audio listeners? Uh, it is the hot logo. Yep. That is our teaser. So, we're, we're, so Wave is actually hot now. Yes. We <laughs> are FRC Team 67 Wave Robotics. Excellent. So a good a good transition and good merger. Thanks again, Nick. Uh, in chat world, all that we ask is if you like the show, it's a tell a friend or post on your favorite uh, social media or, or forum site promoting the show. And please subscribe through our Twitch, YouTube, iTunes, or uh, download our RSS feeds. This is going to help us grow to get more of the first community involved and uh, to help us make first even more loud. So thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed the show. Our email address is firstupdatesnow at gmail.com, and our website is firstupdatesnow.com. You can catch fun shows live weekly on Tuesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern. The next fun show will be Spotlight on February 16th with our guests, the 2015 Championship Chairman's Award winners and the latest Hall of Fame team, FRC 597, the Wolverines. So make sure you check them out. If you don't know that much about them, this is your opportunity to learn more about your newest Hall of Fame team. And as a quick show note, we'll not have the episode of recap on the 23rd because of Stop Build Day. But don't forget that Premiere Night will be on Tuesday, March 1st, and video submissions are due on the 27th of February. So if you want to be part of the biggest uh, video robot reveal, get your submission in by going to firstupdatesnow.com and clicking the Reveal Night link. Thank you once again, everybody, and we'll see you next time on Recap.